Right, ladies and gentlemen, thanks very much for joining us. Uh, there may be one or two more people on the way, but um, they will have to they will have to miss out on the introduction and just join for, for the good stuff, which is what Torsten is going to be talking to us about. So here we have Torsten Thiel, uh, fresh out from Cape Town, where he uh, was with the Ocean Risk and Resilience uh, Alliance, uh, Action Alliance, O-R-R-A-A. Uh, where they're looking for solutions to um, marine protected area financing, uh, particular focus on, on Cape Town in South Africa there, uh, where they worked with Wild Oceans as well. And he is here in Seychelles for a Blue Bond workshop that is coming up towards the end of the week, where he's going to be uh, helping people come with a solution to a regional Blue Bond through the Great Wall Initiative that is, is starting off an IUC and an African-based initiative. So Torsten, to give you a little bit of background about him, he spent almost two decades in the private sector looking uh, at financing solutions, particularly in information, communication and technology, uh, as well as the infrastructure around that. So he, he gained a, a sound knowledge of, of how this connectivity is made and indeed where this uses, where this technology is made and could be used for environmental monitoring as well. Um, he, of course, would go into more depth about that for you if you are interested to chat to him about that. And he used that knowledge of the private sector and of funding opportunities to then delve into more of the public sector and his great passion, which is uh, natural environment and the ocean specifically. And he's been using that knowledge to, to become an advisor for the IUCN. He's been a negotiator for Mexico. He's negotiated at some of the COPs at, uh, for the ABNJ, the Areas Beyond National Jurisdiction, the Biodiversity Beyond National Jurisdiction. He's trying to get ocean finance uh, streamlined into the IPCC and into the Convention for Biological Diversity. So he's really, really well known, uh, renowned internationally, especially in the ocean governance and policy space, uh, biodiversity space, and innovative new financing mechanisms. Um, in, in, in conjunction with all of that, he's also managed to set up the Global Ocean Trust, uh, which is an international trust that is uh, looking at financing and solutions around, around ocean, ocean issues and, and protected area issues. Uh, he's an affiliate scholar at the Research Institute for Sustainability in Potsdam. He's uh, most recently been made a honorary fellow at Plymouth Marine Laboratory. Closer to home, Torsten has spent a fair amount of time in Seychelles working with SACAT, uh, and an advisory role, particularly in the blue carbon and, and marine ecosystem, or, or, or blue carbon and seagrass ecosystem space, where he's been trying to help uh, SACAT and Pew get towards the, the actual space where we can monetize and, and understand the, the value in protecting these and how to, how to go about that in a sustainable manner. Today we're going to be hearing about him from the from Blue Natural Capital to Blue Finance, Innovative Finance for Ocean Governance, as you can see behind me. Uh, and he enjoys engagement, so if there are questions, please ask them. Uh, let's, have, let's open our minds and open our mouths and enjoy uh, an hour of dialogue. So over to you, Torsten. Thank you very much indeed, Stuart. And it's a great pleasure to be here, because for me, Seychelles is the home of Blue Finance. So, so to bring this narrative to you is really a way for me to cross-check my narrative, which I'm bringing to a lot of global discussions and conferences, because I think it's absolutely key that we link what we know from ocean science with what we need for people, for finance, for economics. It's one, one big story, and Seychelles is at the heart of it, the leader of it. So, you all know sustainability needs to be based around ocean science, so we need the scientific facts and, uh, to build on this. But what the blue economy is, and you all know about it, it, it is a narrative of how the blue can be fully integrated into the green transition. But the green transition in the blue needs support and finance, and so the challenges that of the changes we see in the ocean space are really investment opportunities, opportunities for engagement. And so as we are looking at climate and biodiversity risk, we need to identify nature-based solutions that are effective in order to deliver 
long-term sustainable future. And that is where nature-based solutions need to be really integrated into how we think about um, our future economy. And so the narrative that is at the heart of this, and you are very familiar with, is the narrative of blue natural capital, of understanding that it is a viable system of nature, it's the ecosystem services of the ocean that sustain all our lives, and that the blue finance approach, a sustainable blue finance approach, is really a way of working with nature so that we get to a nature positive uh, economy and achieve a path to, to net zero. Uh, all of this is much more evident to you here. Um, let me tell you, when I explain this in some other countries, it takes much longer for people to follow the, the starting point because if you look at the data in Canada, say, big ocean country, the entire ocean economy is maybe 2% or so of GDP. So people naturally think, oh, what does that 2% have to do with the rest of our economy? And then when we start to show them that there are lots of sectors that are directly and indirectly affected by the ocean, but we need to show that evidence, that value chain. Here you already know a lot of these things. So as Stuart outlined, um, I have the uh, chance to bring some of these narratives together just because whilst I'm looking at it to some degree from an academic perspective, I have worked on large project financings in the ocean, around the ocean in my previous day job and have spent the last 10 years really around these governance challenges. And as you will know, often the finance part of the negotiation is added on at the end or not really thought about much. And I've just had that experience on, for the high seas and I'll talk about that a little bit because I first got involved with the high seas treaty negotiations at the UN about 10 years ago on behalf of IUCN and I said at the time, look, you may want to think about the finance mechanism for a third of the planet because it will be not only crucial for the delivery but also for the negotiations themselves. If countries are to submit, commit to large-scale marine protection beyond them, their, their EZs, they need a funding structure to actually do that. And it turned out that it was a hard slog to bring that argument across. But in the last few weeks of negotiations in New York, all of a sudden, there was a lot of discussion about the finance mechanism. And we had put out a, a policy brief through ICN on, on that topic. And it did help uh, to influence the, the discussion of it. So why do we need ocean solutions? As you know, we need to reduce the stresses on the marine environment so that marine ecosystems can recover biodiversity, can come back, and ocean and climate risk, that whole change that comes from the ocean, can only be addressed if we have resilience for people on coasts, for people who live with and at the ocean. And that requires integrating these nature-based solutions both on mitigation and on the adaptation side. We've been working on a, a paper for, for the ocean panel, uh, which is addressing uh, exactly the mitigation aspects of it. It's just as important to think about the adaptation-based approach. And what I've listed here, these comments are all from a paper we wrote in 2019 around what are the simultaneous steps we need to <coughs> undertake to restore ocean health. So it's both an economic understanding, but also deep investment into ocean knowledge and everything around it, water solutions and the marine bioeconomy. And in this other paper from the same year, this started on a little napkin of mine, this little diagram that made it into the paper, because we're trying to communicate to people that at the moment, we're still at the point where the traditional ocean economy as a part of GDP is larger than the sustainable blue economy in a global context. But we need to get to that point where the two lines meet and grow the sustainable part. And the sustainable blue economy is where the future is in the renewable, zero waste, blue space in its broadest sense, whereas the traditional extractive ocean economy 
um, is uh, not going to grow. And so that's where we really need to make this shift of mindset and of opportunity because it's that growing economy that will provide the jobs, the future that is aligned with nature. So we use this narrative in the European Union and established something called Blue Invest. We wrote the Sustainable Blue Economy Finance Principles. I was just one participant, but what was interesting for me when I started to look at the draft, that they were not really very accessible. So I rewrote them. We helped to turn them into seven principles that really just show how aligned the blue is to the green. So that from the finance perspective, financial institutions have clear handle. We are in the same universe. But there are a whole range of differences where we just know less about the ocean, need more precaution, need more engagement. And that's the second seven of the principles. So they're really, for me now, quite accessible and the UNDP is hosting those, those documents and many more institutions signing up to it. Um, but with the Ocean Panel, which is 17 heads of governments now running uh, initially out of Norway, we have this commitment to 100% of sustainable ocean management and the decision all these countries are needing to prepare provide sustainable ocean plans by 2025. And it's really that integration that, again, the Seychelles is leading on of what happens in the MPA part and the protected part and in the usage part of the ocean. How do you best bring that narrative together? And so for me, the sustainable blue economy is a lot around optimizing the activity side and using the protection part as key building blocks. That's where the fish nurseries are. That's where the diversity is that also attracts tourism and, and, and other activities. So bringing that together in, in a clear narrative is, is crucial. But it means that we need to transform, obviously, the traditional marine-based sectors as well as those land-based activities that actually directly impact on the ocean. And that's why we talk about sustainability and circularity at the same time. But also, we need, and this is very interesting for investors, the narrative of opportunity, of markets, pathways, emerging sectors. There is a lot that is, at the moment, quite small scale, that has huge potential opportunity around bioproducts, about using ocean data for optimization, all kinds of activities, and of course the resilience aspect. All that requires its own new industries. And then we need to make it clearer to all the other sectors that are connected with the view, but may not even know that. The technology sectors, the retail, the health and well-being sector. On health and well-being alone, we ran a three-year project for the European Commission and as part of that exercise brought together in a workshop serious way medical profession and ocean profession and we ocean people thought we can talk about ocean health the medical people were saying we're not entirely sure what you mean but we do know that we have massive challenges around depression lack of mobility older people etc and if we can find ways to increase their physical and mental well-being by engaging with the ocean, that will have a ma massive impact. So they wanted solution from us. And what I found interesting from an economic perspective, again, in a lot of large Western countries, the health sector is four times the size of the ocean sector. So if the two get linked, we can have serious benefits. So we did a little back-of-the-envelope calculation, and I had financed one of the UK hospitals, that's about 1.8 billion per hospital, so a large sum. And we would save the National Health Service in the UK probably five of those hospitals just by having an integrated program that brought people to the coasts and worked with the coasts and kept them more active and more engaged. And so we're talking massive savings for the health service by engaging with the ocean service. So it's these new pathways of thinking that allow us to, to actually have a narrative around blue economy, blue finance, that goes far beyond what is the initial entry point that people do understand. 
So in order to make this more practicable, we've worked with ICN on identifying smaller projects that may have bankable financing opportunities. So we've written about that. We set up the Blue Natural Capital Financing Facility as a way to support some of those earlier stage opportunities. And we try to bring this narrative around this integration. So when we talk about tourism, we really need to talk about is how do we transform coasts into thriving areas for nature and people that promote this type of well-being and create opportunities around communities. Similarly, in the marine renewable space, it is part of the energy transition. And we need to make sure that the marine sector is not lagging behind in this transformation but rather becomes, becomes a leader. And so clean shipping and ports and using nature-based solutions around it becomes an important part. When the port of Rotterdam got redesigned, the wetlands around it got increased by a factor of 10. That wasn't done by an ecologist. That was done by a large engineering company that identified the economic opportunity there. So if we can show more of those, if we can value the, the biodiversity benefits, the carbon capture, carbon sink benefits of these nature systems, we can make better decisions around it and lead to, to better investment. And obviously, we have all these opportunities around the blue bioeconomy, food, energy from the sea. So you know all about these themes because the Seychelles is so, so engaged in it. It does require innovation and technology it does require better ocean governance, and again, things like the MSP that you've gone through. The um, concept we've used is ecosystem-based management mandates, because what we found in, in a whole range of countries where we engaged with the MSP process is that it became a planning exercise that lacked what I try to cover with the word mandate here, i.e the focus of what we are trying to achieve in terms of outcome, that it is a commitment to the ecosystem-based management approach that is a mandate to drive the decision-making. When we draw the little maps of an MSP and put these different activities somewhere, we need to have a purpose of a prioritization, a joint narrative that brings, brings this together. And that means on the finance side that similarly we need to identify not just the, the technical financial mechanisms, but also the, the players around it, the activities. So I work myself for the, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development at a certain point and um, saw how important it is to use development banks as sort of entry points for financing, as to risking, but the development banks themselves are not natural ocean banks because they naturally work with governments, they work with existing types of infrastructure. So we've been trying hard to work with the development banks and, and they have a joint effort called Finance in Common to actually make them more aware that most of the planet is blue, that the ocean dynamics will be determining the broader economic narrative, and if you want development, you want sustainable development, you need to finance, support, structure around ocean solutions. So all of this is, is background really saying that blue finance needs to integrate these ocean type opportunities with the sustainable finance narrative. Now, there's a lot happening on sustainable finance, but I can tell you most of the people who work in that space are not linked to the ocean community. And so whenever there's a new effort, like the EU is working in new sustainability taxonomy, the first people they go to are not ocean experts. And um, I had that discussion quite early on, um, and I, at one point Mark Harney finally put the word ocean into the last little footnote of the document because I kept pushing so hard. <laughs> but it just meant at some point we need to bring the ocean in and I keep trying to explain to people that if the ocean isn't in from the beginning, then something is missing and then the narrative is wrong. And we have this new TFND effort, Task Force for Nature Related Disclosures. And again, we just managed to get the coastal marine biome into the, the first draft. The other 
parts of the ocean are, are, are still not there. So finding champions to actually bring this forward, working with larger financial institutions, explaining to companies where these interlinkages are, and showing ways how we can address climate and societal issues through ocean solutions are really ways to try to help create that linkage and help close the, the, the blue finance gap. And that also means understanding impact. So we need to assess impacts of activities so that we can facilitate both regulatory interventions but also ocean investment. For the ocean panel, we wrote this blue paper on finance. And often when we start talking finance, the key thing people look for is the actual flows of money. But there are really a lot of conditions around it that we need to address in, in parallel. So, so we listed seven of, of these actions from common guidelines and strengthening of, of knowledge and data to the enabling environment. But very key is we need an investable pipeline of sustainable projects. So that's core to a lot of what we're doing. Because I think we are at a really interesting turning point where financial institutions in particular are getting interested in all the work you've done and what is happening now. But they then want essentially the answer on the silver tablet of here are these great projects. How can I put my money in there? And so we need to work on the projects in parallel, and we need to develop and incentivize sustainable practices. And insurance is just one of the tools as part of that package, but it can help to, to do risk. We've, I've talked about this integration of the oceans and the global finance, finance architecture and the principles around it. One of the, the terms we've increasingly used is to say blue natural capital is an, invest, an asset class. It's an investable long-term asset, just like, say, a great piece of art is. It's not just about the cash flow comes out. It's about the protection and that long-term value creation. And one of the linkages that we haven't quite achieved yet is that the people who care about the long-term, such as a pension fund who puts money away for 30 years, they would be the right people to help us invest and hold some of, some of that um, long-term asset value. And they, at the moment, find the space still complicated. So there's a lot for us, us to be done around this in terms of building knowledge, directing flows. And I mentioned the, the principles. Um, the International Finance Corporation has done a, a, a is work around guidelines for, for blue finance, which then applies this in a broader sense, trying to identify not just the impacts around um, the sustainable development of 14 under the ocean, but how does the project benefit affect the, the other sustainable development goals? How do the safeguards, the whole ESG universe can best be applied? This is all work in, in progress. But it's encouraging to see that some of these large organizations now have people who they actively try to integrate ocean criteria and standards in the way that they're, they're working. One of the key financial flows in, on the planet is money spent on infrastructure. The forecast is over the next two decades, we're talking about around 94 billion US dollars, trillion US dollars. So, that money will be spent somehow, and it's entirely critical that it's spent in the right way. Because infrastructure spent that is done in a way that is not aligned with nature and local people can be a massive problem in all kinds of places and situations. And likewise, this isn't about finding new money. We just need to redirect money that will be spent in any place in the appropriate way. And that means, for instance, integrating these nature-based solutions into the projects. And so we've done work with the ADB and others to get the project officers, because you have already a team of people who 
understands this narrative, but the person who actually works at the project desk and who is engaging with the country around infrastructure projects may not be fully familiar with this. And what I've been arguing, which goes further, is that from the purely financial point of view, this is a safer, better way to build projects. Because project finance is all about risk management. And if I can make sure that my cash flows are more aligned as the money goes out, because rather than building something big up front, I can work with nature in smaller amounts over time. And if I can make sure that in the longer term the project is resilient, resilient to changes from climate, resilient to changes in, in the way the, the uh, coastal ecosystem works, that project will be better. And that second part of the argument I think we still have to work on, but at least we can work on that first part of the argument where individual projects get assessed as to their impact on nature, how they impact local communities, and how they can be improved through this nature lens. And I go beyond the nature lens because I think it's also an innovation lens. A lot of infrastructure finance is done by large organizations using traditional standards and so on. And there's a lot of really interesting innovation, but it generally is done separately. And so if we have more islands of innovation, more entrepreneurship, more nature based inside the envelope of a large project finance structure, then we have the benefit of that innovation coming in, the benefit of that nature solution, but also the, for those communities and innovators and parts of nature, the benefit of the cheaper funding and the more traditional structure. And so it's really an initial upfront effort we have to make on big new projects. But those projects that, that make that effort will outperform. So this was the quick example. I referred to the Blue Natural Capital Financing Facility, which uh, we did uh, at ICN with the support of, of the government of Luxembourg, to identify a few smaller coastal projects that were already at the point of transition to being potentially bankable. And so this is grant money to support them to make that transition. Because we feel a narrative that is just grant based will always be challenged. Whereas if we can turn projects into viable projects for, for local communities and, and companies, then that's a really interesting change. And, and just one example, because it's one I, I worked on personally, is a, a seaweed farming effort in, in the Philippines, which um, had started out a while ago as a cooperation around marine protected areas between the Zoological Society of London and the local community, so it had nothing to do with what could be potentially commercial. But over time, everybody realized that we needed a core of, of real commercial opportunity there. And it turns out, if you put your seaweed farms all around the MPA, it protects the MPA. If you have your seaweed farmers using the drying, the, the towers of the MPA for drying, they become the guardians of the MPA. If you have um, seaweed farming in a coastal space, then it's not just the men who used to drive the fisher boats, it's also the women who are involved in that process. And then as you realize how the financing works, turns out in the Seychelles, in, sorry, in, in this community in the Philippines, it's 24 women who sit in a circle and decide who, which family gets the $100, whatever is needed to, to start it up. So you change the dynamics, you change the gender dynamics, you change the entire engagement dynamics. And at the same time, there's less need for, for fishing because you actually have a regular cash flow from that local activity. And so you can restrict or the fishing can be more targeted because you have that source of income for, for the family. <coughs> 
Um, we have since launched the Blue Carbon Accelerator Fund with the government of Australia, which is now more about <coughs> focusing on these carbon opportunities. And one of the really interesting discussions I had when I was in the Seychelles last was to think how does one deal with um, seagrass as a carbon sink? Uh, what are the interventions? Could you come up with finance pool and investment pool around seagrass? And so, um, be it in the mangrove space, be it in the seagrass space, there are a lot of interesting debates going on around these topics. And we've just updated the, the blue uh, carbon paper for, for the, the ocean panels that will come out in June for, for World Ocean Day. Um, and it's, a, as you know, a very active space. There have been some prisons on the voluntary market. <coughs> There's some really interesting new opportunities. Uh, uh, around how the, um, the compliance markets can work in this area and um, in preparation for, for COP28 we are working hard to see how this new Article 6 world could be relevant here. So it's all about showing that these benefits that you achieve by looking after important parts of these coastal ecosystems provide, are essentially becoming self-financing, provide the opportunity to, to fund and engage with that area. And that should be a positive spiral, because that engagement doesn't just protect carbon, provides mitigation, but it does provide also biodiversity benefits, resilience benefits, adaptation benefits. But at the moment, the way these markets are organized, none of this is actually being paid for. And so that's really, a, shift we need to make so that it is understood that these kinds of um, protected uh, mitigation spaces, carbon sinks, are really much more than that. They are a much higher value proposition and needs to be treated accordingly. Um, on the, I spoke about the infrastructure. This is one of the, the papers we, we wrote together with with a whole range of, of, of partners because it was important to say this isn't just a group of expertise trying to put this together. This included a whole range of people from um, the in, um, ADB as, as, as a multilateral development bank um, to uh, investment funds such as Meridian um, you see Mercy Corps on here. The lady from Mercy Corps who helped us write this is now the second in charge at the U.S. Development Finance Corporation. So this type of thinking is now going into a whole range of um, institutions and um, continuous work around common standards principles for sustainable finance, for using ecosystem-based standards and nature-based solutions into the blue finance and infrastructure spaces is, is, is a big ongoing effort and challenge. We have a whole community of practice now around the great green solutions discussion. How can we make infrastructure better that also has some gray infrastructure elements? Because it's on the one uh, it's one thing to say we need to do it all perfectly with nature, but then there are also real engineering challenges. And so how you bring that together is, is, is a really important part of the story. Um, I mentioned Aura briefly. Um, Aura has now um, about 70 members. We started out as a small alliance that explained this concept of ocean risk. So I had insurance backing to explain that ocean risk changes coasts. That's now common knowledge. So now there are a number of governments supporting this effort. There are a lot of uh, partners on the coastal livelihood side. And the work I'm involved with here now is, is really trying to develop what we call a sea change impact finance facility, i.e. a pathway for some of these larger investors to engage with a lot of these small opportunities because that is the missing middle, the disconnect we have. And we need to find pathways to bring that money into concrete opportunities. 
Um, Stu mentioned briefly that I've worked in the past on subsea cables. So, as you know, all of our information pretty much flows around the world on subsea cables. In the past, these cables had no connection to the ocean. They just lie on the ocean floor and don't want to know. Now, we have over 10 years developed standards around smart sensing, which will allow the cables themselves to be used to tell us about the ocean, the complexity of ocean systems. So it becomes the idea of a planetary sensor, a total infrastructure around them. The first cable that will have these capacities is presently being laid in, in Portugal, but there are a number of other places. I was actually in my old day job involved with the cable that brings broadband to the Seychelles. I would love to have the next version of that cable to have smart sensing opportunities on it. We were able to understand the Indian Ocean better on an infrastructure that isn't just built for science, expensive for science, but rather is an add-on on already what is the fastest telecommunications infrastructure who get these big data companies to support that, who can use that data to be analyzed locally, because that makes islands great hubs then for working with information. If something is almost real time here, you'll hear it here first before it gets to London or New York. So that is, I think, an exciting aspect of, of what can be done in the future. And you all heard about the progress in, in Montreal around the global biodiversity framework. The discussion in the press has been a lot around the 30 by 30, but you already have the 30 by 30. What um, the other targets mean is that there is a lot more to that global biodiversity framework. And so there is a whole restoration component there is an issue around how to reform, phrase, phase out uh, harmful subsidies. And there is not only an overall financial target, but there's also a specific target of money to, to developing countries. And then there are all these questions about monitoring, assessment, disclosure of risks. So there's a lot of work that will need to be done now in implementing the, the GBF. But if this is done right, if we get the marine, which is most of global university, <laughs> to be at the core of that process, these commitments to financial flows are there. The GEF is supposed to figure out how that's going to work. We need to engage with institutions like that because they won't know how to do all of that. But the Seychelles already does. So bringing that information to the table, finding ways to, to make sure that these large financial commitments flow in a way so that marine biodiversity is, is protected and the sustainable blue economy is grown here is a real opportunity. Um, this breaks it down further on the financial side because it refers to things like increased domestic resource mobilization, national biodiversity finance plans, how do we lever private finance, promote blended finance, raise additional resources, use innovative schemes such as payment for ecosystem services, etc. So there's, there's a lot in, in here to be um, developed, worked on, and brought not just to the Seychelles, for instance, but really to, to the Indian Ocean as a whole. And again, I think with Seychelles' lead role so far, that's the next step for the Seychelles to play. Now, to what degree is effective conservation and management a funding source itself? Can this be a mechanism for finance? I think that's another really interesting challenge and discussion to be had here. And uh, I think, again, something where the Seychelles can lead. And I'll talk briefly about areas beyond national jurisdiction because, A, I've worked on it for a decade, but also we've just had the text. So there is now an agreement, it needs to be adopted and ratified, and it'll probably take two years. The big goal for everybody is, is UNOC 3, so 
conference in June 2025 in France. If we get 60 signatories, 60 ratification processes done by that point, then we have the first conference of the parties for, for the High Seas Treaty. So that's the big goal. And um, in this policy brief last year, what I was really trying to explain is that finance for that is aligned with natural capital economics can really help deliver the infrastructure that we need to do robust BBNJ implementation. And that means data from satellites, monitoring from below, finding a way to, to look after large ocean spaces. And again, your experience is really important. But that creates them, them benefits. And I went a step further in saying that I think if we had an ocean sustainability bank, i.e. a focused institution whose one and only job is to support, finance ocean solutions, the whole spectrum from grants to equity to debt to long-term blended structures, that would be the type of targeted effort that would be required to really raise the bar and, and have a, a focused institution because we all have a World Health Organization. I don't know why we don't have a World Ocean Organization. And so we wrote these little papers, just examples, but one is a regional way of, of approaching this. So the Marine Regions Forum, we looked at how a sustainable blue economy can foster resilience in marine regions, such as the Indian Ocean. And on the other side is that, that high seas finance paper that I already mentioned and um, which uh, now we have at least some funding committed for the period until the ratification is over and the COP can start because it's obviously crucial that we start identifying areas in the high seas we would like to protect, that we start identifying whether our environmental impact assessment processes are up to speed, could be applied on, on international activities, um, thinking about what capacity building technology transfer is, is, is required, thinking about how um, a country like the Seychelles and a lot of others can really be part of making the use of marine genetic resources a meaningful activity. And so we have one article in that new treaty around financing mechanisms and the great Thing is right at the beginning, it's supposed to be adequate, accessible, additional, and predictable. Now, the challenge is in the following parts of the paragraphs, because the special fund, which is supposed to deliver a lot of this capacity building, has very little money committed up front. And so there's a lot more that we need to figure out, whether money comes in from the NGR side, whether the resource mobilization goal by 2030 can help in the process and um, again we were able to um, make sure that the finance committee has has the relevant expertise i would again argue the Seychelles has that type of expertise probably should be on that committee and um, and we wrote this paper around next steps around all these things we could do right now to actually um, make the implementation of the BBNJ agreement a success. A lot of preparatory work, how, how we could fast track it around both the, the bringing the agreement to force, but also building up the institutional mechanism and having the capacity in terms of science, technology, etc. So um, this was really a broad overview to get your, your thoughts and, and, and feedback I think you all will agree with me that the sustainable blue economy is an important component of the transition to net zero and a nature positive economy, but will require finance. And that the success of blue finance relies on accepting this complexity around public-private partnerships and blended finance and de-risking investments. All of this only works if we have robust metrics and monitoring and an appropriate enabling environment on the regulatory side. But nature-based solutions, including blue carbon and blue natural capital, are aligned with 
what modern ocean economics, what modern ocean accounts can provide for, and are a way to engage the private sector, local communities, civil societies, so that we all can jointly address risks and, and support resilience. So this is going to be the pathway of the winners in the future. And the countries that find this too challenging, because challenging it is, may not do quite as well. So thanks, thanks again. Uh, this is just some stuff for future reading Stuart can provide for anybody of interest. Thank you. Thanks very much, Torsten. Thanks for, uh, for providing a little bit of <coughs> an overview and insight into the, the complex and, and fascinating world of global finance and how this can be applied to the ocean space. Uh, a tricky and, and challenging issue indeed. Does anybody have any questions or, or want any clarity on anything that he may have said? Yes, Lindsay. <coughs> If I look at Nipsey Miner, for example, the US hasn't signed a law to see, okay? but they have the technology to mine the, it seems to me, it's a jungle out there, the, 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 the one with the might will do whatever they want. If I just look at, since the Paris thing on climate change, all the big, Multinationals, they've just been dragging their feet to set up all the financing mechanism. So it looks very good on paper, but just, just a war in the Ukraine, and suddenly everybody is spending money on arms. And are we not being too uh, optimistic? Great question. And I am a glass half full kind of man, so I could well be too optimistic. On the other hand, ignoring all the nice language and looking at the facts, we've had a, and I've been to the International Seabed Authority meetings for, for a whole number of years, we have had no mining in the high seas for 30 years. So the practical reality is it hasn't happened. We have had a US that in practice has been following the law of the sea and has had the largest defense company having had an option to own the majority of both the UK license and a big minority of the Singaporean license. Now, what did Lockheed Martin decide a month ago? They sold their stake in these two uh, exploration licenses. So from the US side at least, the feeling is the likelihood of them mining away has shrunk rather than increased. Now, that doesn't mean to say we, haven't, we don't have to be vigilant in that space. And that vigilance means we need to analyze quite carefully what the regulatory environment should be, what the impacts of mining would be on the environment, but also what the economics are. And so my focus has been very much, again, on finance, to think about is the payment system that is proposed fair, workable, etc. And the conclusion was what's on the table now will not deliver any significant benefit share. And the economic analysis was actually if you were to do this properly and pay for your costs properly, you will not make money on deep sea bed mining. So, so at the moment, practical reality is probably better, but vigilance is absolutely key. How can we achieve a, a regime, a global regime that makes sure that there is nobody who ends up doing things that we as a global community don't want. And that's why I completely agree with you on your second point on the Paris Agreement. It is absolutely key that every country that sticks to their obli obligations. And I think we finally have, we have this long debate around the 100 billion, I think we finally have the 100 billion on the table. Now, that isn't going to be enough, but it does uh, show at least an, an understanding of everybody that to make commitments, you need to deliver on those. And um, what is so interesting in the renewable space to me is that in certain sectors, such as solar and 
most of the wind sector, etc. The economics are now so favorable relative to traditional fossil fuel type opportunities that a commitment of money, and I've just done this analysis for offshore wind, for those sectors are very large. And so that investment opportunity is really there. And now it's a question whether all the countries have the right regulatory environment and, and other components to actually get that shift to fully renewable in place. And that, yeah, thanks, Austin, for the you know, um, very informative. And it's good also to get a very good update in terms of the status of things. Uh, I'm just, just wondering, like the, the whole uh, subject of new uh, financing, uh, like you've mentioned, you know, obviously there's a huge uh, financing gap. Um, there's high interest in terms of investors uh, going into into that. Um, like you've mentioned for the BBNJ, you know, as for the, the, the recommendations, you know, like the structure for you know, the financing, you mentioned about the uh, accessibility bank, you know, for the BDNJ uh, aspect. Is there, obviously there's a lot of policy work, policy papers that's made recommendations and so on, and, and you know, it's very dispersed in different conventions, UN conventions. I, is there a similar effort of convergence, you know, to, to have sort of like a, a one-stop shop, let's put it that way, in regards to blue financing, you know, it's like a more concerted effort so that countries or organizations such as like, like us at SECAT, you know, who, who has a role in, in mobilizing resources, you know, have a clearer picture in terms of the flow mm -hmm. of financing that's available at any point in time, and obviously for countries to have better planning for, for investment and, and all that. So I just wanted to know in the bigger picture of things, whether through the um, 2030 by the framework, if there's movement going in, into that so that we have a clearer picture in regards to ocean, you know, blue financing. Uh, it's related to what we have to, for climate change. It's a little bit clearer in terms of where to go and, and that sort of thing. So is there, you know, movement? And, and I, I think it's a great question. I think what we've seen recently is, is almost the opposite in the sense that there are a lot of ideas sprouting in new initiatives. And now we're in the space where we're trying to get those initiatives to talk to each other, bring them together. And then you had efforts like the GCF tried to have a more global approach to blue, but then some of the member states were saying that we'd like a more regional approach to, to blue. And so I think this is still an ongoing debate and be really interesting how how we achieve. So one of the areas is to say, look, at least have common standards and frameworks and then different people use the same approach. So at least that, that would be a helpful start. And um, we still don't have a, a home for blue. And so I, I think that's, again, ongoing argument. Either the existing institutions need to all have their own large blue card or we do need to continue to argue for home for blue. So, yeah, that's I like really it. Home for blue. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody else have a question or something they want to clarify? Oh, just, just putting thrown the question there, um, the difference between deep sea mining and exploration of capital, as it also deep sea mining. Yeah, I think that's, that's one of the really tough challenges. I mean, I, I think globally speaking, there is no need for new fossil fuel exploration because those will all be stranded assets if we are on the proper net zero pathway. Now, that doesn't mean to say that there won't be some places where it will be cheaper than in other places. And so that needs some assessments. So the, 
think the fastest way forward is, is really to identify where can we have fast investments into the renewables because those won't be stranded. And if you look at some of the analysis, 75% of any additional gas that is now bought on screen is going to be stranded asset. So there are already pathways on how to take them back out. So um, it's it's a massive challenge given the, the large amounts in, in, involved and, and countries will, will make different decisions here. So I think the, the countries that go the net zero pathway need, should rightly be requesting international support for that because it's in everybody's interest to do that and, and it's, it may be a, a difficult trade-off otherwise. Austin, I think it's always a pleasure to, um, to hear you speak and to get to pick your brain um, a little bit. When you were speaking earlier about the, um, the blue natural capital financing facilities that are available now in terms of grants and, uh, you know, and creating sort of a, a pool of bankable projects, you know, and, and more and more when we're engaging with um, international partners that have um, potential for investment. This is a bit the, the direction that they're heading. Um, but I think one of the difficulties, I suppose, that as Seychelles we encounter is just the sheer size um, of the investments and the potential for actually um, accessing and uptaking some of the amount of resources that are there. Um, so from your um, work, what would be the sort of you know entry points or guidance that you could think about at the top of your head around supporting smaller islands and some of those um, initiatives. Um, and then I just had a, a little bit of reflections also about um, the potential or the, the potential that you see in insurance as a mechanism um, to support not only efforts for biodiversity conservation, but also in the space of climate change and weather. You see that as a, a potential entry point for for basic science Great. And um, maybe start with, with the, the second, second part one. because that's probably easier. <laughs> in that um, there are really two very interesting angles on the insurance side. So so one is how can we structure insurance in a more effective way for the recipient. And so this is this whole argument about parametric insurance for reefs, etc where the basic idea is that if you have an event that is predefined, storm beyond a certain strength or whatever, you get an immediate payout within 48 hours of the event. So you have money to actually work on the direct follow-on actions, restoration actions, whatever is required at that point. So that's a more effective way of having access to finance. But what, um, I think it's even bigger in the way in the, on the global coast is that probably 90% of coastal communities don't have insurance. And so just giving them access to any type of insurance products so that their resilience can benefit from that would be really important. But that means we need to find mechanisms to pay for the premium so that local communities have an accessible way and and I, I used to finance a lot of um, telecommunications mobile operators. And one of the ways we were able to get to smaller, poorer communities was by changing the units, <coughs> the amounts that were available. I think micro-insurance is, is therefore a similar pathway. So micro-insurance for coastal communities tailored to what the needs of, of, of those are. It's one of these interesting, interesting ways. And then on the other end of the spectrum, of course, um, if investors have like a project but maybe don't like the country risk or have identified a specific risk about the project, then that is something we can de-risk also through insurance structure. So, so there are a lot of ways where I think uh, we need to look at that and, and we're engaging with some of the insurance. I think the, the island question is really interesting because um, it is about how can you create an efficient financing structure so that smaller amounts work. 
but also how you can bundle smaller projects in, in the right way. And I think SECAT has, for instance, a really interesting opportunity as it develops to think about it as a diversified investment pool for the station. So that you may identify multiple smaller projects, but bundle them in a way that then an international investor invests in, in that SACAT pool. And so you already have diversified across the island, across sectors. So that could be one of one of the different ways one, one can approach that. But I think it would be, it, it's about that effectiveness and the mechanisms. And I think one of the reasons why I like the, in the idea of SECAT is, is you already have an efficient structure. And so it's, it's a good start. Um, we're talking a lot about global blue finance, and I'm just wondering if there isn't any opportunity to kind of localize this a bit more, or do you think we're too limited in terms of our, the size of our economy relative to the, the value of our blue natural asset? Or do you think there are opportunities, like we're speaking about insurance? Insurance companies here are obviously very small also, and so their risk has to be backed by other international insurance companies or reinsurance companies or whatever that is, but is there some way of integrating that so that they're again, you know, financing through the parametric insurance and things like that, that those mechanisms are activated as opposed to just a basic insurance finance model. Yeah, I, I think there's a lot you can do at the, the local bottom-up type type level because it is, in, and in, in many ways, that isn't just a problem here for the blue sector. It's exactly the same problem, say, in France. If somebody has come up with a new way of using algae or of better using fish cartilage for a new product, and it's a small entrepreneur who faces a massive regulatory environment, doesn't have the startup money, you have that challenge exactly there, small against what seems like a very large and complex environment. And so that's when we uh, set up Blue Invest at the European level, that really became a, a system and opportunity for these new startup type entrepreneurs to, to come together, to present their idea, to show that they may have one fund already, but really need a, an additional, more public support type funding in the structure as well. And we added to that uh, a new uh, opportunity to create impact funds. So we now have a half a dozen impact funds that were supported initially by the European Investment Fund. And that program has been so successful that it's now growing further. So I think there, there is just a lot of innovation capacity at the, the small local scale. And finding ways how to, to best mobilize that is, is, is key for, for long-term success. Yeah. Um, well, thank you for the presentation, which was quite interesting. Um, <coughs> starting off with the um, parametric uh, insurance system, um, recently I worked on the paper for World Bank. They were looking at um, how to finance coastal management uh, protection decisions for the plan that they produced. And um, the idea was to look at how we can upscale financing for um, coastal protection. And uh, I personally approached um, two of the biggest uh, insurance companies in Seychelles and, um, and discussed with them you know, about parametric um, insurance and whether they can offer something like that in the country. And, uh, and I was surprised that they've never heard about it in the first instance. They, they don't know. I think the biggest challenge that we have here in Seychelles is how do you upscale all this financing? You know, we've done the the debt swap and the blue bond and all that, and we seems to be going round and round in circles. It's, you know, it's a 
although we talk about innovative financing, we seem to be going back to the same multilateral financing system, bilateral financing system, mainly from the regional banks and so on. But upscaling financing for, um, for the environment in general, be it biodiversity or um, building resiliency in climate change and all that sort of thing, remains a big challenge. Um, you know, how do you, especially um, Seychelles being a high income country, you know, whereby we don't get access anymore to cheap financing. And then coming back to what you said, you said that earlier on that um, the hundred billion is on the table, you know, for the um, pledge that was made in Copenhagen in 2009. How was in that meeting at that time, and we were all very happy when we walked out of that um, call. And um, I remember last year I was looking at the figures. <coughs> there was arguments. Um, I forgot the organizations. That said that basically, um, because the European Union was saying 20% of that money has already been dispersed, which would be 20 billion US dollars. <coughs> but when um, it was scrutinized, a lot of it was um, ODA money that had been calculated and included into the whole financing of the climate change um, thing. So, so um, I was interested to know that to hear from you that the 100 billion is now on the table, but it would be good for people to know what the 100 billion is. The, the, the reason I said that <laughs> is that the OECD's last analysis was where we were at 85, and then you had a response that in time for COP28, we would be at 100. And I think it would be worthwhile for you to analyze that. Maybe that isn't technically correct one. I think the broader issue is, is really the, the way you phrased the question before, which to me, as an economist, we have not really achieved that larger transition of saying, these are nature assets. How can I work on the back of protecting the nature assets and use the nature asset as essentially the um, security in, in the transaction? So as an economist, I would be saying to Seychelles is a huge ocean nature asset. That investment to protect and look after the nature asset should be funded on the back of that security and shouldn't be funded on the back of your national debt or borrowing capacity. This is a different type of structure. But in order to get there, we really need to make even more progress around ocean and nature accounting, we need to, you know, if this is, I guess this is what the Bridgetown agenda is all about, this is real transition on how, how we, we handle that. And, and I think we're still at an early stage of, of, of that discussion. If what the GVF was trying to do, I guess, is having seen the problems with the 100 billion narrative, is to separate the 200 billion they put in the GBF as the overall number, and then the 30 billion by 30 per annum as the payments to developing countries, to make it clearer what is public money versus what are these private flows that are brought in or, or other flows. So I, I don't think um, until we achieve the outcomes we want to do, we will not be able to say we are fully satisfied with the way the financial structure is now. And so we can just make suggestions how, how to, to improve on that. And I think you've opened the door. <laughs> well done for that and, and keep pushing. Yes, sir. Um, thank you for your presentation. I have two questions. Um, many times you say so, uh, bankable projects. So I just want to know if you, what is bankable? And second question is, uh, we've generalized the finance, as you said. Now to zero in a bit more, what do you think about um, uh, financing uh, tradable 
financing instruments positions. Um, for example, I have a credit. So is this one solution for a small place? Because somebody also mentioned maybe we can uh, bundle some places, some hectares from different places and say Seychelles nationally. Can, can tradable financial instruments work? So, I guess bankable generally means that in the medium term, a project is self-funding, so it has enough revenues to deal with its financial expenditures. And so there may be a need upfront to lend some grant money or to um, do some upfront investment, but then as an ongoing concern, it can live financially. I think on your second point, it's really um, links nicely to, to one of the proposals which put on the table for, for the uh, seagrass investment group. Because in my humble opinion, if the Seychelles were to say, this is our entire seagrass area and we will look after it, it has significant value and be an interesting effort to turn that into a carbon investment strategy. And um, again, it will be the world first, but um, they, it's, it's not just the Seychelles that are working on this. Bahamas are having exactly the same discussion. So it would be very interesting how we get to that level, whether it's on an amalgamation of individual projects or whether it's a, a national approach. So there's further work needed around that, but clearly, um, these are natural assets and they are carbon sinks worth protecting a lot of benefits. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks very much for your time and for your engagement. Really appreciate it. Nice to hear some uh, opinions from the floor and see, uh, be able to pick the brain of, of Torsten while he's here. Uh, we've got some refreshments outside uh, if you want to stick around for that and maybe have a little chat, but otherwise. Really appreciate you coming out to Australia and have a fantastic rest of your day, rest of your week. Thanks. One more round. Thank you.